Okay, now we're back from the break. Everyone's ready to talk IPOs. <laughs> Thanks for joining me here on oh, stage. Thank you for having me. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about, and, and anyone out there who Googles you would know, you have this long history uh, in the tech industry on the finance side from you know, back in the 90s when we had the first notorious tech bubble and bust. And, and at that time, you were on the analyst side. Now, of course, you're in investment banking. But I want to ask just to start out in general, what does the vibe right now at this moment, where do you see us in terms of history? You know, uh, are we at a peak? Are we at a valley? Are we somewhere in the middle? You know, how do you see this landscape in general? Yeah, I would say if, if, if we use the scale of 1 to 10, 10 being a bonanza and a frenzy, 1 being the market's completely closed, we're sort of back at a 5. I would say this time last year it was probably closer to an eight. Um, the actual number of IPOs within tech this year is down about 50% on a year-to-date basis. Um, and in fact, uh, the sort of mix of those IPOs is still weighted almost 50% to what I would say software broadly defined, SaaS through enterprise. Um, and there's been no consumer internet IPOs year-to-date where last year um, there was a you know, number of, of the 16 IPOs at this point last year four of those were, uh, were consumer IPOs. Um, so I'd say we're, we're more balanced. The, the market's definitely open, though. Um, you really need a couple of things to be able to have an open IPO market. The first is a strong underlying demand for equities. And year-to-date, the market's up, whether you use the NASDAQ or you use S&P 500, around, you know, a, around 10%. Um, the second thing that's really important is there's actually capital, incremental capital. The pot, when we think about fund flows, how much money is coming from individuals into the market to be invested. We've had a great year of fund flows. We're averaging about $1.6 billion of new funds into the equity market versus last year, there's 1.4 billion out average per week. And the last factor is, um, do investors really have a desire to buy these types of sector growth stories? And given the still uncertainty in many regions and the economy, these are sector growth stories, so they're very attractive. So we're in a very positive market. It's just, there's a very balanced view on what companies are going public and how many. Right, and, and there was just a new research report a couple days ago from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, that said that IPO registrations in Q1 of 2013, now this is just registrations, obviously, not offerings, but we're up 41%. Um, do you have any idea why, you know, what's, what's happening now? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely a lot going on behind the scenes that, you know, most individuals wouldn't see. So, you know, I think the sort of IPO market's very balanced now. But if, when we look at the pipeline, there definitely is a nice backlog of a significant increase in the number of IPOs. And it's not just from software. There are a number of consumer internet IPOs um, that I think will be very attractive. And there's some ad tech companies. We haven't had many ad technology companies go public. And so that's a sector that's uh, becoming very viable and ready to, ready to go public. And I think that sector will experience a little bit of a, a shakeout the way we saw in the consumer internet in 2011 and 12. There will be a lot of companies that go public, but not all of them will be, be successful. So there's a nice backlog and it's more diversified than just enterprise software. And, and I want to talk about, you know, yeah, enterprise software. Everyone says that this, is, this has been the year for enterprise software. Everyone forecasted at the beginning of the year that consumer was on its way out and enterprise was going to be the place for strength. Is that true? Yeah, I think second half of last year and the first half of this year, that has been clearly the lead sector in the IPO market. Um, there are a number of things that are very, you know, I think favorable from a characteristic standpoint. Um, one, there's good visibility into revenue, um, not just the current revenue, but also future revenue. And there are a number of different metrics that we use, the lifetime value of the customer, recurring revenue, um, backlog on the balance sheet from a deferred revenue standpoint. So there's a good predictability of the revenue business. They're also very much disrupting these large, you know, traditional software companies, the SaaS companies are, and in many cases, those large companies can't easily replicate these, you know, innovative, disruptive software companies, so there's also a little bit of a premium in the valuation for them being acquired. And so just a great sort of set of positive investment uh, themes. And when we talk about sectors in general, um, I know that personally, if I ever write a story on TechCrunch about, you know, a group on... Uh, people will say, you know, this isn't even really a tech company. <laughs> you know, you kind of, what makes a tech company, I mean, there will be critics that say that this isn't a tech company, this is an advertising company or something. Um, what, in your view, makes something a tech company versus, you know, a consumer 
company. You know, Walmart has a lot of great technology. They have a wonderful website. They have a huge e-commerce operation, but they're not a tech company, according to you guys. Where? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I guess there's definitely a gray area. It's not black and white. I had this debate back in, you know, the late '90s with the retail analysts at, at our firm and who would cover Amazon, whether it's the you know technology person or the uh, retail person. I, I would say the reason why consumer internet has always fell into the tech sector is because it does use technology predominantly to deliver the service to the consumer. The interface, the UX, is obviously technology driven. It's not physically driven. Uh, the distribution and information that's used on that distribution is technology driven. The data and analytics is all technology driven. If you look at Amazon today, I think it very clearly falls into a technology bucket. Uh, it may have started out with selling physical products through a digital distribution system, but it built core competencies in fulfillment, in analytics, and marketing, and payments, and ultimately, and, and obviously uh, hosting, and ultimately it became a provider of those services from a tech service perspective because it had such great scale and competencies in all those businesses. Right, but now today, so that totally makes sense for Amazon, but now if a new company comes to you and says, you know, we're Everlane, you know, if they ever go public and we make T-shirts, we actually manufacture these things, but we sell them online and we have, we have venture capital from, you know, Silicon Valley venture capital firms. Would that be a technology company? I mean, in the future, are all businesses basically going to be technology no, I, businesses? I wouldn't, it's not, we don't try to make that bright of a distinction. We try to say, is it an internet company or not? And it really is tied back to what economy is it riding on? And if you think about the mistakes that were made in the early part of the sort of commercialization of the internet uh, economy versus today, the economy is very different. And it's very clear that you have to cover those companies in a unified way because if you use the wrong economy, you'll miss the wrong secular trend. Okay, and I want to get into once again IPOs because I feel like you know people will talk to a lot of uh, executives who are running internet businesses, and I hear a lot. Why would I ever want to be the CEO of a public company? It's such a headache. <laughs> every every three months, you've got to go and you've got to get on the phone. You've got to talk to in your investors. You have to deal with all these regulations. Uh, why is IPO still you know, an important thing? Why do people want to go public? <clears throat> um, before I answer the question, I'll share a stat. More than 90% of venture-backed companies actually don't go public. They get sold. Um, and so the other group of companies, there's really only a handful of reasons why to go public. W one reason is you need access to capital, and not just um, the ability to use your stock or r raise cash to buy companies, but just the amount of your ability to continue to raise capital in the private market becomes somewhat limited. So the first, one of the first reasons is access to capital. The, the second is liquidity. Investors invest in startup companies with ultimately a plan to exit, and the public market provides that exit. Today, versus 15 years ago, there are many more options than the IPO option for an exit, but it's clearly still an option. And the third thing is what I would say branding or legitimacy of the business. If you're an enterprise software company or a SaaS company, and you have certain clients that are hesitant because of your scale and your size, being a public company adds another sort of quiver in, in, you know, in your bag, so to speak, to be able to prove to them that you're a legitimate company, you audited financials, publicly available, et cetera. Consumer companies, if you look at you know, LinkedIn, it's had a great success since it went public. Um, it's had periods of accelerating revenue growth, so the revenue growth in a quarter is bigger than the prior quarter. I do think that every time they report results and the press covers those results and they're positive and their growth rates are enormous, if you're an executive at a Fortune 500 company and you read LinkedIn's results and you say, are we using these guys for recruiting? Why are we not using these guys for recruiting? That's a positive effect, and we saw the same thing happen uh, at eBay. So those would be the reasons to go public. And if you don't fit squarely in one of those buckets, it's probably not the right idea to consider going public. And I want to talk about you know, the time that it takes to go public nowadays, too. I mean, a lot of people like to bring up the Facebook example. They raised hundreds of millions of dollars in venture capital before they went public, compared to Google 10 years ago that raised you know, maybe 25 million in venture capital. What's happening there? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I definitely think some of the companies went public too late. You know, there's, it's not just a size of business perspective. It's also where are you in the cycle? And so if you're a company that's going public and you're at peak margins and they're going to go down, or you're a company that's about to hit a big product void, or you're a company that's going to go through a big uh, platform shift, PC to mobile, 
it's probably not the best time to go public. You, it's much better to go public when your margins are low and you're still investing, but they're increasing a little bit. Your revenue growth is still relatively high. It may be slowing, but not precipitously um, decelerating. Um, so going public is really a decision tied to those four factors I mentioned before, but then also considering where are you in the business cycle? Because the last thing you want to do is go public and keep reducing your estimates. And if your business is still growing really significantly and your margins are expanding, you have a high propensity to be able to continue to exceed expectations. Okay. Can um, I get you to name any names here, any companies that you think went public uh, at the right time or, or maybe a company that went public a little too late? Sure. Um, I'll tell you who I, I think went public at the right time, uh, and then you guys can guess who I left out and when they went. So I think LinkedIn went public at the right time. Um, um, it was a point in time when there was a very clear strategy. They had a, a management team that was solidified and they were ready to be a public company and the results show that. But they also had a lot of scale. <clears throat> Yelp, on the other hand, was a company that went public right after they had finished a year of about $80 million of revenue. We generally want the last 12 months to be $80 million of revenue and the next 12 months to be over $100 million as a minimum. Those, both of those things have now moved down by $20 million. Um, but I think Yelp went public at the exact right time. They had established a playbook in each market that they could replicate new markets. They were only in, you know, call it 50 to 60 markets when they went public. They were going to enter a lot more markets, but they had the DNA and the footprints to be able to show what would happen in those other markets. So they weren't a billion dollar revenue company. They were a hundred-ish million dollar company, and they've had great success since they've gone public. Okay, so we'll leave it to us to decide who went a little late by all the companies you admitted there. But, um, and I also want to talk about uh, People say all the time that Wall Street doesn't get tech. Uh, that's a huge criticism. I mean, we saw it a year ago now with the, from the road show that Facebook went through when Mark Zuckerberg came in a hoodie, and I think a lot of us here today would say, what's the big deal? He was wearing a hoodie on stage, or he was wearing a hoodie at the road show. Um, but investors really didn't like that uh, to the time that they're public, and people will say the company's completely undervalued because Wall Street doesn't get tech. What do you say to that? Is that true? Well, I think there's two sides to your question. One side is do they understand how to value the enormous growth opportunities of these companies versus how they value other companies? And the second is the social aspect. So on the valuation side, I do think that the market has actually really healed over time and become very good at giving companies credit for future growth as opposed to current growth. Um, companies are being valued on two or three year forward multiples. Uh, they're being valued off of revenue. You look at the multiple of Amazon today, a company that's been public for over 15 years, and it still trades at a significant premium to its growth rate and to other companies because of the enormous um, optionality it has in growth in so many different areas, international, tech services, and obviously still in products and media. Um, I think on the social side, what I'd say is um, the bulk of the investors aren't that familiar with Silicon Valley. There's about 50 to 60 investors that are deep into the culture, deep into the social aspects of companies um, that are you know, startups, and they spend time with the companies, they get to know them, they see them in their own corporate environments. The rest of the investors, which is the majority of the investors, they still wear suits and ties to work. And when they go to Silicon Valley, they probably don't wear a suit and tie, they wear casual clothes. And so their expectation when someone comes to see them may be wrong, but it's based on th those norms. I don't think the investors expect uh, the entrepreneur to change completely, and um, I think ultimately there's, there's a middle ground to figure that out, but an investor's not gonna invest in a company if they only look at the numbers and only get to talk to the CFO. They have to see the management team and really understand how they think about allocating capital, what their vision is, and how they're going to really drive shareholder value. And that can't be done if you don't meet in person. So it sounds like you don't think that the, the roadshow process is actually going to go anywhere. We're not, you're, you wouldn't be a big fan of, you know, a, a video conferencing roadshow. I, I think, you know, we make accommodations on different uh, IPO processes where we do conference calls because some clients can't get to those meetings, but I think predominantly the roadshow is uh, not going to be disrupted in the very near term. Okay. And uh, you haven't always been completely in the finance world. You've also spent some time in uh, companies. You, you were the CFO of the National Football League, which is kind of cool. Uh, how important is it to, to be a CFO? How important is that role? Uh, when should tech companies hire a CFO? What should they look for? I, I think if you're you know, a, an entrepreneur and you're the founder and still CEO and you're thinking about hiring a CFO, 
I think first and foremost, you have to hire somebody you trust that can truly be your partner, someone that can tell you you're wrong and you're gonna listen to them to make sure that you make the best decision. Um, the only way people can really be excellent is with truth. And so you have to have a CFO that will have the intellectual capacity and conviction to tell you you're wrong and try to support it with data. I think the second characteristic is a CFO you know, of 50 years ago was an accountant and a controller and they made sure that the numbers were audited appropriately and they were disclosed and disseminated appropriately. Um, today, I think a CFO needs to be more of an operating CFO, yeah. someone that's using the financial data and the data of the company to help drive strategy and the allocation of capital and the management of risks. I mean, if, if you really think about what their job of a CEO and CFO are, it's really about how do I allocate capital, how do I get access to capital, and how do I manage risk? They're not doing the blocking and tackling of selling every day. And so you need a partner that can be on your side that's helping the organization think about how to set those priorities and, and really drive the business. And the CFO doesn't necessarily have to have been a CFO before. They just have to have those characteristics. Are they a leader? Can they use data to drive decisions? Can they command respect? Can they drive credibility and, and hold people accountable? And at what point should, should companies hire a CFO? You know, I think it's a function of what, you know, if it's still an early stage company with less than 100 people, you don't have to go out and hire a world-class CFO. I think you have to have partners. Most of them may be board members or advisors that are giving you that advice. But I think as you start to enter the point of needing to generate revenue and needing to raise capital because you can't do it easily and efficiently, you should have a CFO. Okay. And um, we could probably have spent the entire 20 minutes talking just about this, but uh, what exactly does an investment bank do when it comes especially to the IPO process? I think, uh, you know, when, when you see the S1, you've got the underwriters, and nowadays sometimes we see, you know, 10 names there. It's, seems like everybody who's on Wall Street is attached to a lot of these big splashy right. IPOs. You know, does it really matter whether you choose Goldman Sachs or whether you choose B of A Merrill? Like, what's the difference here? What do you guys do? <clears throat> um, at, a, at a very high level, there's a couple of big events in an IPO process. The first is drafting the S1, which will be filed with the SEC. And the drafting could take anywhere from, call it five to eight weeks. It could be done shorter or longer. Um, that's an important process. You're really solidifying for the entire investment community the foundation of how to think about the company. We often call it positioning, but you're really you're telling everyone what type of company are we, what are our goals, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, who are our competitors, what metrics matter. And by the way, those metrics really need to tie to your strategy. If you're not releasing how many users you have, but you talk about driving penetration as a strategy, you're going to have a hard time talking quantitatively about where you are in the penetration effort and where, where you're headed. So the S1 process is much more of a, I think a, it's a disclosure document, but it's also an education document for the investors. And you have to have people that you trust to help tell that story in a way that you think represents the company and the strategy. The second thing is getting ready for the roadshow, roadshow slides, preparation, Q&A. The third thing is actually doing the roadshow, and then the fourth is pricing. Those are the four big buckets. Does it matter who you pick? Um, I think it does matter who you pick. I think, you know, having been a CFO, we did a, a debt deal at the NFL and I went on road shows and I picked investment banks and we wrote a document. We did all the things you do in, a, in an IPO, an equity IPO. And I would say the things that mattered the most to me are, are the things that I think should matter to a company is, do I trust this banker? Do I actually believe that what they're telling me is in my best interest, good or bad? Second, do they have credibility? Do they have the ability to talk to investors in a way that the investors are going to believe them in the heat of a storm, in the, in, when the winds come and the rains come, will investors believe them? Can they bring those investors to do this deal in a tough environment? Um, the, the third thing is, do they have experience? Can they say, this was like this at this time, or no, that's not going to happen, and here's why it's different. This is why it's different than this company or that company. And the last thing is, do they have the resources of the firm behind them? Can they go to the firm in a tough environment when it's challenging to get a deal done in a tough market and still get the deal done, get capital from the investment bank, get the traders to take aggressive positions, get the sales force to go out and really sell hard? And if, that's the four things I think that matter the most. Okay, so it matters. Um, and and we're, we're running low on time. There are so many things to talk about with you, but I, I've just got to ask, you know, what were the lessons learned here from Facebook's IPO? That was, we're, we're on the year anniversary here almost. Um, a lot of press about it. Goldman had a big uh, position there. Yep. Lessons learned? So I, I can't talk about Facebook specifically, but I, I think the lessons learned from this generation of IPOs you know, fall into a lot of different buckets. I think some companies went public before they had a proven path to profitability 
or they had a product that had enough history that there was identifiable repeat rate and therefore sustainable user base and therefore sustainable revenue growth. Um, I think some companies went public when there's a big product cycle void coming. It was hard to know that at the time, but when the products were released and they failed, it became obvious that it was really dependent on the, on the product cycle. I think some companies went public at the midst of a transition from the, from the PC to mobile, and we saw the same thing happen from narrowband to broadband, and that's a tough transition uh, while you're trying to go public and convince investors to buy the story. So those are some of the, some of the big lessons learned. Okay, and any company that you're really excited about here looking forward? What's the next big IPO that we can all look for? You know, I think, I think 2014 will be the year of big consumer internet IPOs, and there's a number of them out there. And not just in the United States, there's great, uh, very successful, large-scale, significant valuation companies in, in Europe. China, I think most people are very aware of a, a big Chinese company that will likely go public in the next couple of years. And so I think 2014 will be a big year for consumer internet IPOs. I think SaaS software companies will continue to be um, very attractive and there's a strong pipeline as well. Okay. Well, Anthony Noto, thank you so much. Thank you, Colleen.